It's Wednesday, September 18th. We're receiving a nice light drizzle today here in Northern California, the second rainstorm we've had in a week. Putting a nice mellow touch to the fire season. Typically, this is the uh, most dangerous part of our fire season, but this rain is really gonna help us hopefully ease in to the end of fire season here in Northern California. It's not over yet, but this should help dramatically. So let's go inside the hangar for a big aviation update. So today we wanna do a quick Reno Air Race recap update do a Boeing update, 737 MAX, and for the first time talk a little bit about the new Boeing 777X and the recent door explosion they had during static testing. First Arena Air Race recap had a great time up there last week. Aviation history was made in a minor sort of way when the Reno Air Race Association approved the Stoll Drag Races to be an officially sanctioned race event at the Reno Air Races starting next year. This is the first new air race category at the Reno Air Races in over 20 years. That was when the jet class was added to the air races. Good work Flying Cowboys for getting your act together and getting over 400 pages of documentation through the FAA and the Reno Air Race Association and executing that document nearly flawlessly. The folks were really impressed at the Reno Air Races and we were approved by Saturday night. Typically that takes until January until the board meets before approval is received. Here's your two fastest stole drag competitors, Steve Henry and Toby Ashley competing and filmed by Steve's wife, Kathy. Yours truly is standing on the razor getting ready to jump out of the way if need be, judging for short landings and full stops. Good job Flying Cowboys for getting approved in a accident-free weekend. Unfortunately, on Monday, Mike Patey's Draco aircraft was lost when Mike tried to take off in excessively windy conditions and lost control of the aircraft. Covered in a previous update. But on a personal level, I had a wonderful time at the Reno Air Races because of you, the viewers of the Blanco Lirio channel. There are more Blanco Lirio viewers per capita at the Reno Air Races than I think anywhere else on earth. And I got tremendous reviews from all of you. The feedback on here was pretty consistent. You like the content of this channel and that I'm on point. And that's important feedback to me because when I'm standing here alone in a hangar, I often wonder, is anybody listening and am I on point? When you get feedback from experienced pilots, retired airline captains, retired, recently retired Boeing engineers backing you up on that, that's just tremendous. Thanks. Even my Jenny and the kids were well received and appreciated. As we worked hard to get the Stoll Drags approved at the Reno Air Races, we were invited to be a part of the daily briefing and debriefing of each day's event at Reno and that brings you into a very inside view of how things operate at Reno and things operate on a very time constrained schedule and you get to see from behind the scenes how much work and effort it takes to get this three ring circus to keep it on time special Shout out to uh, Shifty, the operations officer at Reno, who's retiring this year, who's gonna be replaced by Bear, for keeping that train on track. 
and everything was going great until I think it was Friday or Saturday, the Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds, you guys were late, like 20 minutes late, and they kept getting conflicting phone calls as to when you were gonna make it. Of course, the Thunderbirds stage out of Reno Cannon Airport to come up and perform at Reno Stead Airport. And then once you got there, I think it was on the same day, you broke the deadline. You flew dang near right over the crowd. Everybody else at Reno was able to perform flawlessly on time and staying out of the deadline. And at the Thunderbirds, you blew it that day. And you know how harsh your debriefs are. And I'm sure you heard about it because by Sunday, everything looked good. Unlimited Air Racing at Reno this year was more of a parade lap and special thanks goes to the Sanders family for bringing out their entire collection for the Reno Air Races. Well, not complete their entire collection, but their collection of unlimited aircraft and Sea Furies. And Dennis Sanders, the owner of Dreadnought, finally got to win the Reno Air Races in his aircraft. Dreadnought has won the Air Races before, the Unlimited Gold, but for the first time the owner, Dennis Sanders, got to pilot his own aircraft for the win. Congratulations, Dennis Sanders and crew out of Ione, California, Eagle's Nest Aviation. Now, the Unlimited class was what the uh, Reno Air Races was formed on nearly 50 years ago. And that class, as we talked about in previous updates and in live updates up there, has slowly been dwindling. It's, it's just a simple matter of market economics. It's too darned expensive. Is the class dead? Not yet. And if they can get additional sponsorship, it's always about the money. If they can get the money, you can see the fast unlimited air racers return to Reno. Last year, the Air Race Association made money. We gotta wait and see how this year does. Fred Telling is the CEO of the Reno Air Races. He is working as an unpaid CEO. He's a business guy, but first, he's an airplane guy. He knows the importance of the unlimited air racers and what they mean to the future of the Reno Air Races. And if they can get the financial aspect of it worked out, the Unlimiteds will continue to flourish. Well, they'll continue to fly at the Reno Air Races and hopefully grow in numbers in the future. It's all about the money. Meanwhile, over at Boeing, we're starting to get some results from a board that was formed back in April by CEO Muhlenberg to look into the 737 MAX disaster and how operations are running at Boeing. Sort of a case of Boeing investigating Boeing, but also on this board are some independent safety experts, some folks with uh, expertise in such disasters as the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the NASA Challenger, and Fukushima. Some of the word that's coming out of this committee is, lo and behold, top engineers are no longer going to report directly to the business leaders of their units, of their aircraft make and model. Top engineers are going to report to the chief Boeing engineer and then report to top business leaders of their particular aircraft that they're working on. Because of course when top engineers report directly to the business leaders, the pressure for time constraints, unrealistic time constraints, and cost cutting just becomes too prevalent. Also, this committee is forming a safety committee to overview and oversee the over 100, the communications within such a huge industry, over 100,000 employees split between two major headquarters at Seattle and Chicago. A second group has been formed called the Joint Authorities Technical Review, and this group is uh, headed by Chris Hart, former head of the National Transportation Safety Board, and this group is looking into the certification and regulation process, that process between the FAA and Boeing. This is Chris Hart, formerly of the NTSB, who will be looking for improvements in transparency in the certification process at Boeing. Now let's talk about recent issues on the Boeing 777X line. Now on to the Boeing 777X. The Boeing 777X has been quietly continuing its certification process at Boeing, overshadowed by the 737 MAX debacle. When one program 
is slowed down, it tends to slow down all the programs. The Boeing 777X was slated to start test flying back in June, but it still has yet to make its first flight. How much of the delays of the 777X is related to the 737 MAX is hard to tell. However, the primary delay right now with the 777X program is with the engines, the GE9X engines and problems with the stator vanes. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. And that's holding up the first test flight of the Boeing 777X. The whole idea with these new designs is increases in efficiency and passenger comfort. The new 777X is going to be able to fly higher and more efficiently than previous iterations of the Boeing 777. The higher altitude is going to give it the fuel efficiency plus the efficiency of the new engines and then they're also going to need to be able to build a stronger fuselage to lower the cabin altitude from a typical cabin altitude of 8,000 feet down to about 6,000 feet for increased passenger comfort. This means a greater P pressure PSID or pressure differential working on the fuselage. In other words, you're going to pump more air into the balloon and it's got to be able to handle that over the number of cycles of the lifetime of the airframe. Now part of the testing procedure for these new aircraft are static tests. In static tests, they build a monumental steel cage and strap the aircraft to it and attach cables throughout the aircraft, particularly to the tops of the wings, and bend those wings up to 150% of the design limitation. Also, in the fuselage, they got to test the number of cycles and the amount that, of pressurization that the fuselage can handle. Again, they got to pressurize that fuselage and it has to pass tests up to 150% of its design limit. It was during one of these tests recently where they had the, apparently they were doing both simultaneously, which is a pretty extreme test, but necessary to pass for certification. They were pulling both the wings to 150% stress load in the positive G direction and pressurizing the aircraft simultaneously to 150% of design limitation when one of the two cargo doors blew out. It's not told. They've not said which cargo door it was. Typically the Boeing 777 design has two cargo doors on the right side of the aircraft, one forward of the wings and one aft of the wings. They didn't say which cargo door blew out and they didn't say what failed on the cargo door yet at this time. Cargo doors on the Boeing 777 are typically hinged at the top and have a series of hooks on the bottom that hook this massive door into position. Most of your other exit doors on the aircraft are plug type doors that plug into the fuselage and they can't blow out. They, they physically cannot blow out. Well, they can't be opened in flight. This is a picture of the cargo door jig from Kawasaki Heavy Industries in Lincoln, Nebraska, who are manufacturing the cargo doors on the Boeing 777X. Here's what the aft cargo door looks like on an earlier model of Boeing 777, hinged at the top and hooks in the bottom. So on this particular test on the wings, if you're taking 150% of 2.5 Gs, the design limitation, that's cranking it up to about 3.75 Gs. To do that, they're pulling these cables and pulling the wings up and that's creating a wing flex well over 20 feet of wing flex. This is because of the new material science behind these wings. A lot of carbon fiber materials are used in these wings to not only make them very light, but strong and flexible. They need that flexibility to maintain their strength throughout their life cycle. Because of the huge 235 foot wingspan on the new wings, the outer 11 feet of the wing will be foldable so that it will fit into the existing gate and airport structure. The 150% safety margin is just that. It's the built-in necessary safety margin for your aircraft design because often design limitations are exceeded during operation of the aircraft throughout its lifetime. If these design limitations are exceeded during operation, a maintenance inspection is required to determine if repairs are necessary. 
For the fuselage, the old design limitation was about 9.1 PSI differential between the inside and the outside of the fuselage. Now that they want to fly higher with a lower cabin altitude, they've got to increase the strength of the fuselage to about 9.9 .9 PSID. 150% of 9.9 .9 means they had this thing cranked up to about 14.9 pounds per square inch differential when the door failed. Now when you're adding this huge stress onto the wings of the aircraft, you're putting a heck of a load on the fuselage as well and typically you'll see on the side of the fuselage oil canning or ripples begin to form in the side of the fuselage as this stress is built up. All this added up together ended up causing that door to fail. We don't know why exactly yet that door failed, but they will have to get this fixed in order to pass this test at 150%. The wings, when they last tested that to failure, they got those wings up to about 154% before the wings failed. These are 787 wings being statically tested. And that 154% number may be for an earlier version of the 777 as that video is rather dated. I'll put a link below. So what does all this mean time-wise? Well, probably not much of anything because of the delay with the GE90X engines. That's the primary delaying factor with the Boeing 777 line right now. And so that buys engineers times to get this door thing sorted out in the meantime. By the way, these doors are being assembled or built by Kawasaki Heavy Industries in Lincoln, Nebraska. So that's what we know is going on with Boeing up to date. Keep tuned on this channel with your notifications window. This is the 17th or 18th video in a series of videos on the Boeing 737 MAX. So you'll need to keep abreast of the situation here to keep current and qualified on what's going on. If you got a lot of questions, go back and review some of the prior videos in this series. See you here. Sun's coming out.